Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, and I think the new faces. Um, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Begin Center. Um, among other things, I have responsibility for most of the events and the programs that we do uh, here in English. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here for this. Uh, this is our eighth lecture in this Mr. Prime Minister. It's our, our fourth one um, that we've um, done in this, in this new format of, uh, of Zoom lectures. Uh, for those of you new to this format, um, firstly, as I've said, uh, I'm going to ask everyone to please mute themselves uh, so we don't hear you and don't hear any background noise in your, um, in your uh, uh, houses or apartments. Um, at the end of our presentation, at the end of our speaker's presentation, um, I'm, there'll be a chance to ask questions. That'll be done by the chat box uh, at the bottom of the at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll read out those questions. So uh, after I've said a few words of introduction and introduced our speaker, uh, he will give his lecture and then we, he will be happy to take questions from you. Okay, so to today's lecture. Um, if I can speak personally for a minute, um, for people who are around my age, um, let's say under 50, um, and perhaps particularly for those who, like me, grew up outside Israel, uh, Shimon Peres was, I think, a particularly significant leader. If you weren't born or you were very young uh, when Ben Gurion or Golda or Begin uh, were the Israelis that were being mentioned uh, internationally, um, Peres is the name that often comes to mind when we think about uh, who was being interviewed or featured on uh, on BBC or um, or CNN. Uh, partly, I think, because his he had this almost unbroken political career from the mid 70s uh, and, and to his death a few years ago. Uh, but also I think because in that last, in that last role that he had as president uh, of the state of Israel, um, he really acquired um, this stature of, um, of uh, an international statesman uh, in a way that I don't think uh, any other Israeli has. Um, and like others that we've looked at in this series, he sharply divided opinion, um, but it's really impossible to ignore the contribution that he made um, to the State of Israel as Prime Minister, as President, as Defense Minister, Foreign Minister, and even before his formal political career when he was a, a trusted uh, confidant of, of, of David Ben-Gurion, as I think we'll, we'll hear. Um, so um, those are the, my, my uh, just opening remarks. Um, to tell us about this, this man's really amazing life and career, we're very fortunate to have with us um, an outstanding um, Israeli historian and uh, biographer uh, who knew Shimon Peres personally, uh, having met him uh, first in 1961, uh, Dr. Michal Barzoar, a former member of Knesset and an award-winning author of almost 40 fiction, non-fiction books, that's almost 40, one of those by, this is one of those biographies that makes the rest of us feel very inadequate, um, including, of course, biographies of Shimon Peres and David Ben-Gurion. Uh, his books have been translated into 18 languages. Uh, he also taught political science and history at Haifa University and in the United States at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Dr. Michal Bazar. Do you hear me right now? Good evening to all of you. You know, about 15 years ago, when I was at Shimon Peres' office, he suddenly turned to me and said, you know what? We have to work on nan nanotechnology. I said, what? Nanotechnology. I had no idea what it was. He spoke to me and then to our friends about this science which takes care of the minute very very small particles and molecular molecules and which can solve quite a lot of problems and all of us we just listened and uh, 
took it not with a little grain of salt. And then Shimon started inviting to his office scientists and uh, donors and university professors. And before we saw, this man started an effort, an Israeli effort, to create a great nanotechnology project in the country. And today, 15 years later, we are the leading power in the world, the leading nation in nanotechnology. And then I found out that I was for a while with Shimon Peres, the dreamer, because that was a dream which he just succeeded to fulfill. And that was one facet of Shimon Peres, the dreamer, because he was also a statesman. He was also a politician, not a very good one. He was uh, also a man of defense. And if you want to really to find what was the real Shimon Peres, he was what they called Mr. Security, the man in charge of the security of Israel. He was not prepared for that, you know. He was born in Belarus in a small village called Vishneva, immigrated to Israel, uh, became very, very deeply involved in the uh, Israeli return of the people to agriculture. He grew up in, Sh in Ben Shemen uh, village. He met there this beautiful girl whom he saw one morning when he was watching the, the, the village. He saw a girl coming out in one of the uh, courtyards, a very beautiful girl with a Greek profile, long hair, short pants. He fell in love with her, that was Sonia, and he would marry her later. And then he left the Ben Shemen with Sonia. He wanted to establish, to create a kibbutz. That was his dream. But the World War started. All his friends actually volunteer either for the British Army or the uh, Jewish uh, Brigade in the British Army or the Palmach. Paris began, remained out of it. He didn't want to. He said, I'm going to work the land. I'm going to create a kibbutz. Sonia was very angry about it. Uh, she, of course, volunteered for the British Army. She passed the war as a driver of a British truck, bringing uh, ammunition and other materials from Le G G Egypt through Palestine to Lebanon. And she left him. It was kind of ultimatum, either you uh, enlist in the army or I'm going away. And they went their own separate ways. And only at the end of the war, when she came back, he succeeded to convince her finally and marry her. Now, at that time, Shimon made his first piercing, first breaking of the glass ceiling. He was a member of a youth organization called uh, the Working Youth. Anwar Alved, and this organization, which was a huge one, about between 11, 13,000 kids, they belonged to the left-wing party of MAPAM, which was very pro-Soviet and pro-communist in its views. Stalin was for them, as they call him, the son of the nations. And uh, the party of Shimon Peres, MAPAI, the party of Ben-Gurion, was very much worried that all this young generation might become one day the future generation of the extreme left wing. They had to be stopped, but nobody did anything. And Paris, a young boy, 21 years old, started traveling from one village to the other, from one plant to the other, meeting the young members of working youth 
and trying to convince them to join him in his ideas. And then try to imagine 1945, there is the big Congress, the big convention of working youth, which is actually uh, carried out exactly according to the Soviet, uh, I would say the Soviet formula. People are filling the, the, the big uh, Congress hall. Then the, the speaker announces the name of the members of the presidium which had to be elected, the secretariat of the, of the convention. People are voting unanimously for the, this list and they start their deliberations. Now, we have the same situation. The speaker announces uh, this is the list which we're going to approve. And all of a sudden, young Shimon Peres raises his hand and he says, I have a different list. Drama, because nobody ever had done such a thing. There is, there is a kind of ordning here. They say, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, I, I want to present to the convention a different list, let's vote. So they vote and Paris wins. This convention become, becomes a very dramatic one. At several votes, Paris and his friends win. And they were the minority in, in, the, in the working youth. So finally, they find a solution, a very Jewish and, and the Israeli solution, a compromise. They decided to elect two secretary generals for the working youth, Shimon Peres and another guy. The other guy resigns after a few months and Peres becomes the only secretary of working youth. And today it becomes a kind of young generational branch of the Mapai. And if you meet today, how many? 70 years after, yeah, 75 years after, you meet the old members of the kibbutz, the kibbutzim, they will tell you, Shimon Peres, he stole the working youth from us. He stole the working youth. And indeed, that was his first step into politics. And then a year later, there is a Zionist Congress in Basel, in Switzerland. The, the, the Palestinian Jewish delegation is going by boat. On board of the boat, he meets a young hero whose name is Moshe Dayan. They talk and they become allies for the rest of their lives. Dayan is the one who leads, Paris is following, but they are working together in the political field. And then the creation of the state is approaching. We are 1947. Shimon Peres is in Kibbutz Alumot, where he takes the herd out and is very happy about it. Sonia is with him. And then one day, a member of the Ben Gurion entourage comes to the Kibbutz and says, Shimon, we want you to join the forming uh, assistant group around Ben Gurion in the Haganah. Shimon had never been in the Haganah before. And he goes to Tel Aviv, to what they call the Red House. And here he becomes a member of the staff. Uh, he meets there a guy, another guy, who is assistant to Ben Gurion. His name is Levi Eshkol, future prime minister. And uh, Eshkol says to him, younger man, do you know how to swim? Paris says, uh, no. He said, get into the ocean. If you get out, great. If you don't get out, even better. And Eshkol becomes a kind of patron to Paris. In the meantime, Teddy Kolek comes to, to Tel Aviv. Teddy, at this time, is the representative of the Haganah in New York. He's buying secretly, illegally, weapons and defense materials of all kinds and brings them to Israel. Now, he said that he wants to have a kind of opposite number in Tel Aviv with whom 
it can it can work. It can work. So Paris uh, is called by Levi Eshkol, who says to him, "Younger man, do you know Teddy Kolek?" He says, "No." Do you speak English? He says, no. Have you been to America? No. He says, oh, you are the man I need. And Shimon Peres is appointed to be at the head of this organization which buys weapons for the nascent state. Now, Teddy Kolek is very angry. He wants to strangle Eshkol for that. But for Paris, a new world is opening for the first time. He starts buying weapons, organizing illegal, uh, send, illegal, illegal uh, uh, weapons to be sent to Israel from America. He even buys at a certain point. At a certain moment, he buys an air carrier. Uh, and we don't need an air carrier. The Haganah does need an air carrier for the war. Thank God it sank very soon, so so we didn't have this problem. And then Ben Gurion appoints him as the uh, civilian head of the Israeli Navy. And one day Ben Gurion comes to him and says, Shimon, you have to prepare a plan. How shall we conquer the Negev? And Shimon, together with friends like uh, Arthur Ben Natan, perhaps some of you know him, uh, they prepare a very, very detailed plan of the conquest of the Negev. And according to this plan, the Negev was conquered. So step by step, Shimon is arriving to, first of all, to meet, to, to know this, the world of um, the military world of defense and of secrecy. But unlike his friends, once again, he did not, he doesn't join the army. That's a tremendous mistake because all the young officers. They are the future elite of the state of Israel. Alon, Rabin, uh, Barlev, everybody we, we know, Sharon, of course, everybody we know in the years after has been an officer, a soldier, a fighter in the war of independence. And Paris makes a big mistake politically and personally for not joining. The war ends. Paris is sent to New York to be deputy director of the Israeli delegation of purchase of armaments. He comes back. Ben Gurion is very much impressed by this young man and makes him, at the age of 29, director general of the Ministry of Defense, which is a very important position. And Paris, in this job, starts to build power. He is a man who, uh, even, even Nathan Altermeyer, the Israeli national poet, called him the builder. He knows how to amass and build power. And he makes really the Ministry of, of uh, Defense, he makes it a tremendous power in Israel until today. <clears throat> Ministry which has all the attributes of a government with all these different departments. So what will he do in this ministry? He's director general of the ministry and is, I would say, kind of uh, rara avis, a strange bird in all this uh, collection of Israeli politicians. He reads books. In the Israeli cabinet at the time, except for Ben-Gurion, I wouldn't say that they were very avid book readers. They're not exactly uh, intellectuals. Golda doesn't read, Eshkol doesn't read, the others don't read. Paris comes every morning and tells them the stories about the book he read last night. They look at him strangely. And then another problem, problem. Israel at this time, <coughs> we are the first eight years of our existence. Israel fears that, that soon or late, or sooner or later, there is going to be another attack by the Arab states. And we run into the danger of being annihilated. What can we do? We have to buy weapons, but we can't buy them. Where? The United States told us very clearly, you won't get from us anything, not a bullet for your defense. America is not a very good friend. 
that's also one one legend which are trying we are trying to develop today about this secular friendship etc. That's a Mickey Mouse story. America was not a friend. So America doesn't want to sell us weapons. England, England looks at it at us actually as if Israel is their enemy. I, I was in London to see in the public record office and I saw that uh, they, in, in their papers, in their documents, Israel is supposed to be a, an enemy of England. That's the word they said, enemy, an enemy country. So what can he do? He says to his friends in the government, you know what? Let's turn to the French. And that's another strange proposal because the French are not uh, uh, supposed to be great fighters, great soldiers. The French, you know, they didn't fight very well during the World War. And Ben Gurion doesn't appreciate very much their uh, military capacity. And now we have to turn to the French. Nobody in the cabinet even knows the French language. Nobody has never, never spoken French language. Nobody's been to France, really. And this Shimon Peres, who does know French, does not know French, decides, let's go to France and try. And he comes, as he said, with my kibbutz boots and the short pants. I arrive to France and he starts working. He goes and meets congressmen, members of parliament, senators, uh, reporters, army officers, politicians, ministers, Jewish leaders, and step by step, he creates a pro-Israeli lobby. And the elections in France are coming. We are December 1955. And uh, Shimon asks Ben Gurion, do you allow me to go to France and try to convince the political parties to support Israel in this electoral campaign? Ben Gurion said, go. Paris arrived to France. My friends, he's told to go to a certain Jewish clerk, not clerk, I would say senior official, who works with the prime minister. His name is El Gozi. He goes to Mr. El Gozi and he said, will you help me? El Gozi invites him home. And in this house, which is full of art and pictures, in the, in the living room, there is a kind of, of chair, uh, like a throne, and on his throne is sitting an old woman, Mr. Elgozi's mother. And she says to Paris, show me your hand, which he does. And then she turns to her son and says, you'll do everything he asks you for. You must do it, which is a strange story. But Elgozi takes it seriously. The following day, Elgozi, who is the economic advisor to Prime Minister Edgar Ford enters the office of the Prime Minister and says, you know, Mr. Perez from Israel is here. Can I give him my office for what he wants to do in this country? And Ford says, go ahead. And that's why the Israeli manager of the Defense Ministry finds himself in the adjacent office to this of the French Prime Minister and from there, he is actually carrying out his electoral campaign. He goes to see the leaders of the parties. He explains to them how important it is to help Israel. And he goes to see, among others, Mr. Guy Mollet, who is the French, uh, the head of the French Socialist Party, very close by its uh, principles to the Israeli Labour Party. And, uh, Mollet told him, says to him, you know what? We are brothers to your party in Israel. We are all socialists. We shall help you all the way. And Perry said, yes, yes, yes. We heard that promise before. When we spoke before to the, to the socialists in England, the Labour Party there, with the, their, one of the leaders was Ernst Bevin. Bevin told us we shall help you 
And the moment they got into power, <coughs> Bevin became our greatest enemy. Mollet doesn't say anything. And to, great, to the great surprise of all the French media and public opinion, the socialists win the election. Paris is invited to the prime minister. Mollet, Guy Mollet meets him on the, on the stairs and he said to him, now you'll see that I'm not Bevin. And indeed, France changes its policy. Now they have, they have, there's a French government composed on one side by the socialists, and on the other side, the radicals. The radicals, all what matters for them is the war in Algeria. This time, the Algerian people, the Arabs, are revolting against the French rule. They want to become independent. The French cannot understand it because according to the constitution, Algeria is a part of France, exactly like Paris is a part of France. So why would the, why would the Arabs want to secede from our union? There must be somebody behind the scenes who is inciting them against France. And they find the, the man. That must be Nasser, the president of Egypt, is the one who gives them money, who trains them, who sends them weapons, we have to fight him. And here we find that uh, the, I would say, the uh, example of the famous formula, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Nasser is the enemy of France, but Nasser is also the enemy of Israel. So that makes France and Israel very close. And beside that, there is a very close friendship which emerges between the Minister of Defense of France, Bourges Mounouri, and Shimon Peres. They become buddies, real friends, to the point that we used to call Bourges Mounouri the French Shimon Peres. And we get from the French planes and tanks and weapons. For the first time, we feel that somebody is on our side and we can get enough weapons to defend ourselves from the second round that our Arab friends are promising us. In July 1956, the Egyptians, Nasser, is nationalizing the Suez Canal. France and England want to go to war against Egypt, but they need a pretext. They can't just come and, uh, and invade Egypt. They need a pretext. And what can be a pretext? If Israel goes to war against Egypt, then they can intervene, the French and the British, and separate the fighting forces, the Israelis and the Egyptians, and take control of the canal, and at the same occasion, also get rid of Nasser. They invite David Ben Gurion to a secret meeting in Paris. Ben Gurion flies to France together with Shimon Peres and Moshe Dayan. They meet with the French and the British in total secrecy, and they reach an agreement according to which Israel would parachute troops close to the canal. It will announce that. Our troops are fighting close to the Suez Canal. The French and the British will immediately send ultimatums both to Israel and to Egypt and say, you have to retreat about 10 miles from, the, from each side of the canal, which means for Israel to retreat 10 miles from the canal means going 200 kilometers or 200 miles uh, west to the Suez Canal. And the, the Egyptians have to leave the entire Sanhe Peninsula and cross the canal and go back 10 miles behind it. Of course, it means that for Egypt, it's a terrible ultimatum for Israel. That's exactly what we can dream about. And indeed, that happens exactly that way. 400 Israeli paratroopers are jumping over the Mitla Pass, close to the canal. The Israel announces that our soldiers are fighting the Fedayun, the, the uh, terrorists close to the canal. 
France and England uh, sent the ultimatum to Israel and to Egypt. The Egyptian refused. We accept. And then the Sinai campaign starts with the French and the British supporting the Israelis. And we have a tremendous victory, as you know. 1956, we conquered the entire Sinai Peninsula even without the help of the French and the British. And a new era stands for Israel. The French and the British try to invade Egypt, a total fiasco, they fail. But we, Israel, is now, now there to stay. We succeeded to beat the Egyptians in a very quick war. The gap between us and the Egyptians has grown. We can be very happy about it. And then in 1956, start actually the golden age of Israel, which will last for about 11 years until 1967. But there is another thing which happens during these secret negotiations in Paris. During the negotiations, try to imagine the picture. They, they are carried out in a secret isolated villa close to Paris. In one room, Moshe Dayan and the French and the British are just now writing the agreement between the three countries about the war and the ultimatum and everything. In the living room, which is a just good size living room, on one side you have the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, Antoine Pinot, and the French Minister of Defense, Borges Monori, Shimon's friend. And on the other side, Ben Gurion and Paris are standing. And Ben Gurion says to Paris, now go. And Paris crosses the living room and he approaches Bourges and Antoine Pinot. And he said, says, listen, we are going to give you the pretext for your war. We are going to risk our position in the world, in the Muslim world, which will hate us for being your allies. And we might be attacked. So we shall need for the future a deterrent. Everybody understand what deterrent means. It means a nuclear well, a reactor, nuclear power. So Pinot says, uh, Bourges Maurice says immediately, I support it, we shall help you. Pinot says, oh, we can't do it because, because of the Euratom organization. According, Euratom is the European Atom uh, Nuclear uh, Agency. He says, according to the rules of, of Euratom, we are not allowed to sell uranium to any country outside of Europe. So we can't do it. We can't sell uranium. So Paris said, you know what? Don't sell us the uranium. Lend it to us. Send us the uranium. We shall use it for our reactor. The moment we're finishing, we shall send it back. Oh, good idea. And they signed the agreement. And everything is perfect. Paris goes back to Israel. They start preparing the building of the reactor. And they, they find two things. First of all, everybody in the body politic who is into this secret is against it. Lev Vieshko says to Shimon Peres, you see my, the palm of my hand? Hair will grow here before I give you one penny for your crazy idea. Golda is the greatest enemy. No way, no way. First of all, she hates Shimon, which is true, because Shimon actually, she's Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Shimon Peres is actually adding to his ministry quite a lot of functions which should have belonged to gold. So she hates him, and that's for many years. But on the other hand, she's afraid of the Americans. We cannot build a nuclear reactor without the, the, the Americans know about it. No, I am against it. Golda also doesn't understand anything about the relations with France. She doesn't speak French. She doesn't understand the French mentality. She was also opposed to the, the negotiations before 
the Sinai campaign. So she's against it. Uh, it's Hak Rabin, the future prime minister. He's totally against it. He does have a big vision. So he says, you know what? With the money that will cost, I can build another brigade of uh, armored brigade of tanks. That's fine. The Achdut Avda, the left wing uh, socialist party, with Igal Alon and Galili, says we don't want to touch anything about the, uh, the, the nuclear. So everybody seems to be against it. The only two are Paris and, and Ben Gurion and Moshe Dayan. Moshe Dayan says to Shimon, No, Shimon, go ahead. I am behind you. But remember one thing. I am completely unreliable. You can't rely on me. So Paris has to, to, to do it in spite of the fact that the body politic is against him. But it's not only the body politic. He tries to bring the scientists. We have very good scientists in the Weizmann Institute in the university. All the nuclear scientists of Israel are against it. They come and they say, we don't have the power to bring a nuclear, to build a nuclear reactor. Only two professors. One is Ernst David Bergman, who is Ben Gurion's advisor on scientific matters. And the other one is Professor uh, of Dostrovsky of the Weizmann Institute, the man who invented the Israeli formula for heavy water. These are the only two scientists who support the idea. So who shall, who shall build and, and staff the reactor? You don't have the scientists. So Perez goes to Haifa and succeeds to organize a group of young engineers who are just out of the Technion and they are full of motivation. They look for challenges and he inspires them with the idea that they are going to build the most important thing for the existence of the state of Israel. They want to go. Another hitch. The wives of the, of the engineers don't want to go. They say, you want to build it in Dimona, so we have to live in Beersheba. Beersheba at this time was a kind of uh, very, very uh, second class city. And they said, we don't want to go to Beersheba. Shimon invites them and said, why don't you want? The one said, because in all of Beersheba, there is not one beauty salon. One beauty salon in Beersheba. So Perez promises them. He said, I take the responsibility that we will have a beauty salon in Beersheba better than those in Tel Aviv. So that's one obstacle in there. The second obstacle, they say, we are young mothers, we have children. We need, we need uh, medical care. And that's how Soroka came into being. A year and a half later, Soroka was there. And until today, as you know, it's one of the best hospitals you have in Israel. But, and here comes the big but. Early September, no, mid September, 1957, we're preparing to build the reactor. Golda comes back from Paris. She just met the new prime minister, who is Bourges Munori the former Minister of Defense, now is Prime Minister. She met Gimolet, the head of the Socialist Party. She met Christian Pinot, who is again Minister of Foreign Affairs. And Molay and Pinot told her, we changed our mind. We are not going to support the Israeli reactor. We're not going to do it. Finished. So she comes to Ben-Gurion. And she says, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure she was sorry. I'm sorry, there's going to be no reactor. They are against it. And Paris is sitting in the corner of the room. And he says to Ben Gurion, he said, do you mind if I go to Paris and try to change their minds? Ben Gurion said, go. Golda is not very happy. Paris flights to Paris on the 30th of September, 1957. He arrives in the middle of a terrible political crisis. It is the Fourth Republic. Perhaps you remember the Fourth Republic in France. Every couple of months, the government was falling, falling. New government, new government, new prime minister. Everybody was new. 
So that was a terrible, terrible mess. And today, because of the war in, in Algeria, there is a motion of non-confidence in the parliament and the government might fall every minute. Now the government is led by Paris's friend, Borges Monnery. Paris, Paris arrives on the 30th of September. On the 1st of October, early in the morning, he goes first of all to the office of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Pinot. Pinot is a very nice gentleman, I mean. I know him very well, very warm. He opens the door, he said, Shimon, I am very pleased that you come. Come, come into my office. But I want to tell you from the start, I changed my mind. I am against giving you the reactor. Very sits down. He has worked all night, the night preparing answers to the possible reasons why Pinot is objecting to the reactor. And he speaks for an hour, explaining why the Russians are not going to intervene, why it's important for Israel to have the reactor. He promises that if at a certain point, we shall want to build nuclear weapons, we shall consult France before. And finally, after an hour, Pinot says, you convinced me, I'm changing my mind. Wonderful. Paris did not believe it until today. He says, I don't understand. Why did he change his mind? I convinced him in an hour. And he says to Pinot, okay, if you're, if you remove your objection, call the prime minister, Bourges Monnery, and tell him that he can pass the decision in the cabinet to give you the reactor. He tries to call him, does find him. So he writes him a letter. I seen, I've seen that this letter saying, I, I agree that we have to support Israel's demand for a nuclear reactor. And he adds by hand saying, Mr. Perez promised me that if Israel ever is going to build nuclear weapons, they will consult us first. I agree. He, and the minister himself burns all the copies of the letter, gives the letter to Shimon Peres, and Peres runs to the parliament to find the prime minister and give him the letter. He knows very well that if today, while well, the, the parliament is, is, is boiling, if today, we don't succeed to pass the resolution in the cabinet and sign an agreement with France, everything is gone. So he must get the agreement and signed by the prime minister of France. So he slips the letter into the cabinet meeting room and Bourges Monnery passes a resolution of the cabinet that they agree to give the reactor to Israel. And now, uh, they have to sign it. Paris waits outside for Bourges to come out of the meeting and sign the agreement. But in the meantime, in the plenary session of the parliament, there is a huge, huge fighting, cries and shouts and, and Bourges Monnery must run into the parliament and defend his position. And Paris is waiting because he must sign it. At 4 p.m., one of the secretaries of Bourges comes to Paris with a glass of whiskey. He said, please, the prime minister is busy at the plenary session, take a glass of whiskey. He will be coming out in an hour. At 5 p.m., he comes back with another glass of whiskey. 6 p.m., another glass of whiskey. Paris understands about eight, nine in the evening that Bourges is not going to come. He goes back to his hotel. At midnight, the French government falls. The, the parliament votes non-confidence. So it's finished. No, no agreement. Ben Gurion writes in his diary, I found in Ben Gurion's diary, the entry of that night, he said the radio announced that the French government has just fallen because of the Algerian problem. What a pity. Shimon went to Paris in vain. No. The following morning, Paris meets with Bourges Monnery, who is now an ex-prime minister. And he says to the French prime minister, ex-prime minister, he says, you know what? 
let's backdate the government, the, the agreement, as if we signed it yesterday when you were still prime minister, before your government fell. Boucher said, Bonne idée, good idea. And these two guys forge this document. They change the date to the date of yesterday. They sign the agreement. And that's how all our effort, all our nuclear story is based, is based on a forged document, on a fake document. I asked Shimon Peres, I said, how could you do that? Oh, he said, come on, Michael, between two friends, 24 hours, that's nothing. 24 hours between two friends. And on the base of this document, we received from France all the equipment, all the material, and everything started working. But that was not the story, the end of the story. In 1958, President Charles de Gaulle decided to try and, and block this friendship with Israel, also on the nuclear field. And uh, he announced, his people announced to Israel that the nuclear cooperation is going to end. Now we are in the middle of building the reactor. In Israel, there are about 200 French engineers who have received houses in a special neighborhood in Beersheba, that's called the French Quarter, and they work at the reactor. They are building the nuclear reactor of Israel. And all of a sudden, we get word that the French, the, the French are not going to help us anymore. Ben Gurion flies to Paris in 1960 and 61. He has two meetings with President de Gaulle. It just doesn't succeed to make him change his position. And finally, de Gaulle says, let's leave that to Paris and to Kouf de Murville, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France. Let them try to find a solution. And ben, uh, Shimon Peres goes to see Kouf de Murville. He is not a friend. Kouf de Murville, the Foreign Minister of France, is actually very much pro-Arab. He had been ambassador to Cairo before. He likes the Arabs, he does like Israel. And the meeting is very unpleasant. Kouf de Murville said, we change our minds. We shall stop everything. We shall give you any a compensation. And Paris said, listen, we've been swimming. We are now in the middle of the lake. Swimming back is like swimming to the other side. Don't stop us now. He says, we are sorry. We cannot continue. That's the end of it. And Paris says, you know, Mr. Corden Reville, that uh, uh, if you stop that and the Arab nations and the Muslim nations hear that you have been had been building this reactor together with us, you're, you're going to be ostracized in all the Arab countries. Oh, says Kudun, don't worry about that. We shall keep the entire thing secret. Nobody will know. Shimon says, I'm sure you're going to build to keep it secret, but I cannot promise that from circles in Israel, word would not come out about your help, which is a kind of uh, I would say, very quiet uh, blackmail, which means if you stop, we are going to leak that to the world media, and then the Arab world will be against you. And uh, Kudun listens and says, you know what? In English, you have a point there. And they, they reach a compromise by which France will continue in a more limited way, but they will continue. They will give us the plans for the completion of the reactor and they will do everything possible for us to build. But a new enemy appears on the horizon, as you see, for all these obstacles. His name is JFK. John Kennedy, president of the United States, is utterly opposed to Israel building a nuclear reactor. He wants to stop it at all costs. He writes letters to Ben-Gurion. I have never seen such blunt, hostile letters by any American president 
to an Israel leader. Stop that. And there's a lot of threats about the help to Israel, about the family of nations, about the United Nations, about Israel being isolated. It's, it's a terrible series of letters sent by, by Kennedy to Israel. And I also found the meetings between Kennedy and the French foreign minister, which I mentioned before, Couve de Merville, and you have to see how Kennedy is pressuring the, the French, stop helping the Israelis, stop it. Until in April of 1963, Paris comes to Washington for a different matter, and he goes to see the uh, one of the advisors to Kennedy. As he sits in his office, suddenly the door opens and Kennedy is on the threshold. Oh, he said, Mr. Perry, as if he didn't know. Oh, you're here. Why didn't you inform me? Come to my office, we'll have a cup of coffee. So Perry goes to, to Kennedy's office and Kennedy says, tell me about your nuclear reactor. What are your plans? And Paris says to him, we shall be, we shall never be the first country to bring nuclear weapons into the Middle East. And that becomes the mantra, the motto of Israel's foreign policy until today. Ask any government spokesman, he will repeat the words of Paris. We shall never be the first to bring nuclear weapons to the Middle East which is not very exact, but that's what we say, okay? We are speaking in 1963, Ben-Gurion resigns. It is place we have Levi Eshkol. Ben-Gurion and Eshkol get into a big fight about the nuclear, about the uh, Lavon affair, which is a different, a different lecture. And finally, finally Ben-Gurion and his close friends split away from the Labour Party and create a small party called Rafi. And in these parties, you can see Ben-Gurion, Perez, Rabin, uh, Perez, Dayan, not Rabin, Perez, Dayan, Teddy Kolek, Itzhak Navon, all the group of people who were close to Ben-Gurion. But in uh, 1973, you know, the Yom Kippur War erupts. At that, that time, for the first time in history, Paris becomes, is, is a minister in the cabinet of Golda. She is a minister in the cabinet. In 1974, Moshe Dayan has to resign together with Golda. He resigns from his office as Minister of Defense and Paris becomes Minister of Defense of Israel as Rabin, and Rabin as Prime Minister. 1977, Rabin gets involved in a stupid story of uh, dollars which he keeps in an American bank. He resigns, we go to the election, and that was that big turning point. The Likud is winning. Menachem Begin becomes prime minister. The Labour Party loses 19 seats in parliament, and become, they become an opposition for the first time in history. Well, in 1981, after the Treaty of Peace with Egypt is signed. Paris leads the Labour Party into the new elections. I was the campaign manager for these elections. And we succeed to get back almost all what we lost in the former election. We get 47 seats in parliament, but Begin and the Likud get 48 seats. So Begin forms the new cabinet once again. In 1984, for the only time in his life, Perez wins the election. Perez get 44 seats in the, in, the, in the Knesset. Shamir, who is the successor of Menachem Begin, gets 41. But when we compare the blocks of the left and the right, as you know, we did it all the time now, during the last year, you're experts in that. We see that we have two blocks of 60. 60 support Paris, 60 support Shamir, and then the Jewish creative mind invents the rotation. We create a rotation government, Paris becomes prime minister for two years, the two first years, 
Shamir Minister of Foreign Affairs, and then they switch jobs. And that's the first time that Perez become Prime Minister of Israel. He is in power for two years. He is a very good Prime Minister. He succeeds to stop the huge inflation, which was a terrible blow to Israel. He succeeds to get the army out of Lebanon and to find a solution to the Sinai with the Egyptians. Very good, very good Prime Minister. And then he hands the, the job to the to, to Shamir. But Shamir and Paris have totally different opinions on political questions. If you compare today the uh, center left to the Likud, you see that they are much closer than at the time of Paris and Shamir. And in April of 1987, Paris is no prime minister anymore. Shamir is no prime minister. Paris flies secretly to London, meets with King Hussein of Jordan, and they both reach an agreement about a peace negotiation between Israel and Jordan, in which Hussein knows that he cannot get back all of the West Bank and Jerusalem. Anyway, this agreement, the London letter fails, and uh, Shamir wins the next election. Afterwards, in 92, Rabin will become prime minister. I didn't want to stop at Entebbe in 1976, in which Paris's minister of, of defense was the man who planned a candidate out, because that's, that's a long story. But anyway, 19, 1992, Rabin wins the election, becomes prime minister, and Paris is Minister of Foreign Affairs. Rabin is assassinated in 1995. Paris becomes prime minister in this place. And then Rabin is assassinated in November 1995. The elections have to take place in almost a year. The young people and the advisors of Paris come to him and say, go to elections right away because you have a tremendous advantage and you have about 20 points more than Bibi Netanyahu, who for the first time is the leader of the Likud. Go to elections right away, you will win without any problems. But Paris refuses. Finally, he told me one day, I didn't want to get elected on the blood of Yitzhak Rabin. And he delays and delays and delays the, the vote, and finally, he loses the election. Bibi Netanyahu becomes prime minister. And Bibi, becoming prime minister, he told me himself, he said, I didn't know how to work with Arafat and the Palestinians because in the meantime, Paris and Rabin had signed this agreement with the, the PLO and Arafat. Arafat is back in Gaza and Jericho. The Palestinians are here. Bibi is a new prime minister. He doesn't know nothing about them. How shall he talk to them? And then one of the most absurd things happens. At night, Shimon Peres disguises himself, as does his secretary, uh, Yona Bartal. A car of the Shabak of the Shin Bet the Secret Service picks them up and they go to Jerusalem. Bibi told me Sarah used to prepare a bottle of whiskey, not of pink champagne, a bottle of whiskey. And we spent the whole night, every night, with Shimon explaining to me and briefing me how to talk to the Palestinians. And then Shimon goes back to Tel Aviv, and the following day in the Knesset, he's the head of the opposition. He attacks the government. If they had known in the Labour Party that their boss is helping Bibi Netanyahu during the night, they would have hanged him on Kikar Dizengoff in Tel Aviv. But that was the way it, it, it was. Paris said to me, I had to help because that's Israel, not Israel. Anyway, he stayed in politics. After the election, he moved to Kadima with, with his friend, Arik Sharon, who was a very, very frequent guest at their home in Ramat Aviv, the home which is uh, next to mine in Ramat Aviv. He liked very much the uh, uh, honey chicken that Sonia used to prepare for him. 
And Shimon decided to run for president. The first, in the first attempt, he was beaten by Katsav, by Moshe Katsav, who then chose to go to prison for rape and uh, harassment. In the second election of President Shimon Peres won. And uh, I, I was meeting every day downstairs his wife, Sonia. And Sonia told him, to, I was once, I'll go back a little bit. When I was chair, campaign chairman, I was every night, I was going to Shimon's apartment and he was coming back from his public appearances and telling us what he said, what they said to him, etc. And one night Sonia told him, he said, Shimon, die. Shimon, enough. She didn't want to get involved in these political manipulations and maneuvering. Because as I said before, Shimon was not, was not a great politician. He made a lot of mistakes and a lot of enemy and his credibility was always in question. And Sonia said enough. What she wanted, I told her, what, you, what do you want? She said, I want to go back to the Jews. I said, when? She says yesterday. She didn't want him to continue in the politics. She said to me, as long as he was working with Ben Gurion, or was in working for the defense of Israel, I was with him. But the moment he started manipulating and, and carrying out these political functions, I don't want to stay with him. So when Shimon was running for president and the chances were very good, I met Sonia downstairs and she said, Michael, go to Shimon, tell him that if he is elected, I'm not going with him to Jerusalem. I'm not going with him to the president's home. And I went to Shimon. I said to him, that's what Sonia said. So he looked at me and said, she will come. Don't worry, she will come. She did not. Not only she did not come, but she told him, don't come home anymore. She changed her name back to Sonia Gal, which was the, the name of her cousin for family, originally Gelman Gal. And it was even written down on the, on the, on the intercom, Sonia Gal, and she never met him again. And she died without him seeing her. And he tried to send her all kinds of messages by interviews in the press saying that I miss her very much. He wants to go to, to be with her. She told me, I want Shimon to leave every, the politics, to come with me, to live with me at an old people's home so we shall finish our life together. It was very painful to see these two people who really loved each other very, very deeply, unable to meet to, at the end of their lives. And Sonia died before, before she knew. He had a very good presidency of Israel. He became one of our great presidents. He carried out this famous uh, conference, uh, President's conferences, where he brought the great major leaders of the world and the great scientists and Nobel Award winners to discuss the future of the world. What can we do for the future? And he got also a very great position in the world as one of the moral leaders of, the, of our century. But he had so many failures in his life. Uh, he died at the age of 93, but he had so many failures and still he always got up. If, I, if somebody wants to understand the character of Shimon, I'll take him back to Vishnieva when he was a three, four years old kid. He would go to his grandmother's home with a friend who was very muscular and big to the age of four, of course. And they were playing at the game, who is going to throw the other on the ground. So the other guy would push him on down. He would, fall. He would raise, rise up and, and say in Yiddish, Nochamol, once again. Nochamol, the other three on the ground again, a third time, four times. Finally, the grandmother would say, Shimalo, that's enough. He's stronger than you. And she would say, no, because next time I might win. 
and that was Shimon Peres all his life. Next time he might win. And after all these failures, my good friend Amos Oz said once, my comrade, my friend Shimon Peres, stumbles and falls, stumbles and falls, because his eyes are in the stars. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. You can only, you can only hear me clapping, but everyone else is clapping as well. Um, that I think more than, uh, perhaps more than any other um, uh, speaker that we've had in this series, you've had the, a, an incredible challenge of having to fit in such an enormous span of time into a, into a, a, sh a short lecture. Um, and obviously, you know, um, that you couldn't go into detail on everything. So I'm going to encourage people to ask questions about things that interest them. I already have a couple of questions for you. Um, there was a question about um, uh, why, can you explain why was there so much animosity between Perez and Netanyahu? I'm not sure if there's a particular time that the gentleman was referring to. What was the, can you say something about the relationship between Perez and Netanyahu? On the contrary, there was a very special relationship between Perez and Netanyahu. Netanyahu told me that himself because, you know, my relation with Netanyahu was started when I called him, he was ambassador in, in, in New York, in the United Nations. And I was publishing a book called Lion Hearts. And I called Netanyahu and I said, I want you to write a chapter about your brother, about Yoni in Entebbe. And Bibi said, give me an hour. He called me an hour later and he said, Michael, I would prefer that Shimon writes this chapter because Shimon was the, the one who sent him to his operation, his operation. And from that moment, the Chimun sent Yoni to Entebbe, they became close friends. And you have to see, Chimun spoke at the Yoni's uh, funeral. And Bibi tell me, told me that uh, for, the, for the Netanyahu family, the words of Shimon were very important. And as Bibi said to me, when we ran, when I ran against him in 19, 96, I gave the instruction to my people not to attack him personally, because there is a special relation between my family and Shimon Peres. But if you speak about animosity, you'll find it between Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin. There, there it was animosity. There it was pure, pure, clean hatred. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about uh, something you referred to um, about Paris choosing not to participate in the military, not mm -hmm. to recruit. Um, why was that? Was that why did he decide not to? Um, and um, and and the, and the second part of the question is, given that he didn't do that, how did he then still manage to get accepted in Israeli politics without that military experience? Well, the first point is that. Um... He always gave different reasons. I asked him several times, why didn't you want? He said, I didn't want to be, a, a, to be a private and to have some general giving me orders. Then it was, he said, I believe that as a civilian, I can do more. There were, he didn't give the real reason. And uh, I think it was a big mistake because all the friends of Shimon Peres, if you take uh, everybody, Arthur ben Natan, Alterman, everybody, everybody told him, who told me, that was a big mistake. And indeed, the question and the answer is in the question, because it was not accepted in many circles of politics because he did not serve in the army. You know, uh, Eagle alone said about him that I never met him in a trench when we were fighting. And Chaim Hefer, who was the, uh, you know, the uh, poet of the Palmach, he said, this guy heard bullets flying only on the phone. And for Paris, it was a big obstacle in his life. But I must add something personal. I wrote in my biography of Paris that he did not serve in the army. He was president already, he called me. He said, why did you write that? He said, because you did not serve in the army. Who told you that? 
I said, I just got you your file from the, who gave you my file? I said, I got it from the army archives. Ah, so it, it says that I didn't serve it. Yes, you did not serve the army. Take it out of the book. I said, Shimon, I can't take it out of the book. That's the truth. You give me, if you prove to me that I was mistaken and you did serve, I shall change it to make my mea culpa before the entire world and, and, and accept it. And I had some very unpleasant experiences with Shimon when I would come to his office. Sometimes we're alone. Sometimes there are a few people. Sometimes there are a lot of people. And in the middle of the conversation, he would start yelling at me, take this out of your book. And I would say, Shimon, I'm not taking it out unless you give me proof. And in the middle of his shouts, the door would open. His secretary would walk in with about 20 of my books about him, put them on his office, on, on his desk, and then he would take his pen and start signing the books. The same books which he wanted me to change because he did not see them done. And he did that. And that was for him uh, finally a big, big mistake and, and a big obstacle in his political career. Well, uh, thank you. Um, there was, uh, you mentioned that um, he didn't give the, the real reason for not serving in the army. What, what, someone's asking, what was the real reason as far as you are? You just don't know. No idea. Okay. Because Shimon, Shimon was a brave man. I was in a situation in which you see, you saw the, the courage he had in himself. So why, why this kind of, he even, he even lost his, his, the love of his life at the time. Right, Sonia left him because of that, because he didn't want to join the army. Twice, twice he changed it, twice he refused. I can't tell you, the, I'm not a psychiatrist, I cannot tell you what is going inside his, his brain, but it was a big mistake. I spoke once to Uri Avneri. You remember Uri Avneri, who was a man, a radical crit, critical critic of the government, of the, of, of the state and everything. And Uri told me, I was, Already I had my, my rebellious ideas. And I knew very well, if I don't serve in the army in the war of independence, I will have no right to open my mouth afterwards. And he served, he got to win and everything. She won't do that. Um, okay, thank you. Um, there was, uh, there's the, your comments about uh, the animosity between Paris and Rabin, which of course is, is, is quite well known. Um, has prompted uh, a question about the reason for that. Is that, al is that also to do with Perez not serving in the army and Rabin being a military man, or is it more than that? That was one point. For Rabin, uh, everybody was judged according to what he did in the War of Independence. Rabin was the commander of uh, the Arel Brigade of the Palmach, which tried to assure the, the, the road to Jerusalem and to defend the road to Jerusalem. And he was very much involved in that, personally, emotionally. But there were more, more reasons. Rabin actually was crowned by the old guard of the Labour Party when Golda had to resign. And all of a sudden, Shimon Peres does the same thing which he did with the working youth. Remember I told you about it? He, he jumps and says, I am also running for prime minister. Now, Rabin was the candidate of the majority. Paris was then the candidate of this tiny fraction, which was the Rafi party. And they were very small compared to the majority of the Labour Party. And Paris is running. And Rabin could not understand it. He was very angry. Why is this guy coming against me? Especially that in the election, finally, Rabin won, but by a very slight majority. Even Golda, even Golda, Told Rabin, she said, listen, he has the right to run against you. That's a democracy. Yeah. And, but, but Rabin was very, very angry at him about that. And then when the election was over, I remember the speech of Rabin. Rabin turned to Paris and said, Kol tuv lecha Shimon. Which means, uh, sail, good sail, good sail, Shimon, good, good way. Bye bye, Shimon. And Yitzhak Navon came to Rabin and he said, Shimon is going to become your Minister of Defense. Rabin said, never. 
then it's like Nevoah said, you just count the votes and see how many votes Shimon Peres got. He is now the leader of about 40, 42% of the party. He is the next use of defense. And Rabin had to appoint him, but was very much against him. There was no love lost between these two people. All, all along the years, until Rabin's death, there was a tremendous animosity shown mostly by Rabin. Shimon perhaps hated him the same way, but he knew how to conceal it. Rabin showed it very openly. And that was very sad to see the prime minister and minister of defense of the same party, of the same country, the same generation, fighting each other all along the way. Uh, one thing that uh, you, you didn't mention that I think is interesting, I'm just going to use my uh, prerogative as, the, as the, the man with the microphone to ask this question. Um, one of the interesting things about Perez, when I think about the history as, I, as, I, as I've read it, is that he, we think of him now as, you know, the, the kind of visionary guy who was talking certainly from the, from the 80s onwards and then very much with the Oslo process about peace. Um, but he was also, as Minister of Defense in the 70s, um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but quite pro, pro the settlement project, pro the settlement building in the West Bank. Um, was that, what, what changed his opinion about that? Did he change his mind? Was one did he was it was it more a political um, thing that was going on in the seventies when he was supporting settlement building? He did indeed uh, support the settlements. He was the the one who authorized the first settlements in the West Bank, as you know, and he was very, I would say, very moved by the fact that all these settlers were coming to his office straight from the settlements. One of them I remember was even barefoot when he arrived. They were coming straight. They were all, they, they were wearing their kippas and open. And he was very happy to have Hanan Porat and all this group around him. And during this period, he was really uh, much more, I would say, to the right than Rabin was. Shimon Peres continued the, the, I would say, the tradition of David Ben-Gurion and Moshe Dayan. He changed later when he, uh, because of several reasons. One of them was that uh, he was surrounded, and I remember that very well. Uh, I, I'm a Bengurianist, I'm much to the center, not, not to the left. And I remember that he had around him a group of left wingers, like the spokesman of the Labour Party was Yossi Bailey, who was very much to the left. One of his greatest advisor was Yossi Sarid, another future merits leader. The uh, assistant to Yossi Bailey was Gideon Levy, who is today a reporter for Aretz and writes all these extreme left wing uh, papers. And Shimon was quite influenced by this young group around him. So another point was that he became the deputy president, vice president of the in Socialist International. And there he had all the leaders who on one hand were very respectful toward him, but on the other hand, were very much what you call today to the left. And he got impressed step by step that, that that's the way to go. And I, on this subject of going to the extreme left, I had endless fights with him. I worked there. I was meeting him. I was telling him that the Labour Party is going to lose. Because Ben Gurion told me once, you don't, you can't govern Israel from the extreme left or from the extreme right. You must be in the center, in the consensus where both sides are finding a common language. And that was a big mistake by Paris. And also his hopes about Oslo were a little bit going too far. But you know what? I want to tell you something. When they signed the Oslo agreements, and they met with Arafat on the south lawn of the White House. It's a famous picture, as you remember, all of you in shaking hands with Arafat and Rabin, reluctantly shake hands. Neither Rabin nor Paris realized that by signing these agreements with Arafat, they were opening the way to a Palestinian state. Hmm. I spoke to them, I asked them, 
Paris told me, we thought about an upgraded autonomy in the West Bank for the Arabs. Rabin said to me, never there would be an Arafatic country, Arafatic state. Both of them did not realize what they were doing. Because every child should have understood the moment these people are shaking hands under the presidency of Clinton with Arafat, when they bring Arafat to the West Bank and to Gaza, and to Gaza and to Jericho. That's the first steps toward statehood. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a, that was a very enlightening, very enlightening response. Um, okay, I think that's I think that's it for now. And um, I want to thank uh, Michal Bez Barzoa for an absolutely incredible uh, speech, lecture, education for all of us uh, about one of uh, Israel's really re most remarkable um, leaders and prime ministers. Um, I want to thank you, um, uh, Dr. Barzoa, very much. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Next week is our last of these lectures about the prime ministers on uh, Ariel Sharon, and um, we will be continuing with some other programming after that, and I will, I will contact you all um, uh, to let you know about that. Um, so thank you all very much, and thank you again, Michal Barzoa. Thank you. Bye. All right.